questions about the dangers of the release of superintelligence. Now what happens when you put a Prometheus in their hands? And what does that mean? I'm mean, yes. We want it in alignment with human values. And his approach to that is part of a larger philosophical discussion about the nature of intelligence and life. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Today is July 16th, 2024, and you are watching and listening to the Daily AI Show live. And today we are going to have an awesome conversation about Max Tegmark's vision of API. Uh, AGI, <laughs> AI, uh, seven years after he wrote a book, Life 3.0. And luckily today we have an expert in the room that that knows all about it, but including with that expert, who is Andy, by the way, uh, we have June, me and Beth and I'm Brian. And uh, we, we all know a little bit about it, but this was Andy, this was your idea to talk about this book. I will be the first to say, I did not know this name when you first said, hey, let's let's do a show about this. I was like, who and what? And please, ChatGPT and Perplexity, please help me. Um, but I will tell you, I, I've, I've learned a lot. I'm actually really excited to have this conversation. So I'm really excited for you to kind of bring this in case, you know, lots of people from our audience are not familiar with this book from seven years ago and what it really means for our current, you know, world of AI and, and what's going on. So with that, I will happily turn it over to you, Andy, to uh, impart all the knowledge and wisdom. Well, I won't be the one imparting, but I'll try to collect it. I think one of the virtues of the Daily AI show is that we introduce topics that, you know, at, at the outset, we don't really know much about our, even ourselves. We're learning alongside each other and along with the audience in many respects. And I had the opportunity uh, last year to read this book. Uh, Life 3.0 by Max Tegmark, and it really was foundational to my understanding of AI. And I was surprised later to find out that it was written in 2017. But let me tell you just what it is. It's, it's a thought-provoking exploration of the future of AI. It's a, about the benefits and the risks, the ethical considerations, and the technical challenges of controlling a superintelligent AI. So who's Max Tegmark and why is he in a position to comment on this even? So he's, uh, he's from Sweden and he showed an early aptitude for technology. He sold a word processor and a 3D Tetris-like game while still in high school. So one of those guys, like Mr. Reindeer, he pursued education in Sweden. He got a master's in engineering physics from the Royal Institute of Technology and, and this is important, a BA in economics from the Stockholm School of Economics. So he's very broad in his academic pursuits. And, and his study of economics, I think, is relevant to his posture as someone who can comment on the future of not only the development of AI, but the future of life and, and how things work in our economies. He got a PhD in physics in 1994 from UC Berkeley. And then he joined MIT as a professor in the Department of Physics. He's been elected a fellow of the American Physical Society, uh, awarded the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering's gold medal in 2019. And in 2023, he was included among 100 most influential people in Time Magazine, um, uh, and, and specifically with respect to AI. Okay, his, his research at MIT is focused on cosmology, which I think the nature of reality and the universe on physics and artificial intelligence. So I wanted to paint the picture of a kind of a buckaroo bonsai superhero guy, uh, you know, who's really studied a wide range of subjects and is a major con commenter and influencer in the world of artificial general intelligence. now. And his approach to that is part of a larger philosophical discussion about the nature of intelligence and life. And um, we recently, you know, uh, OpenAI kind of laid out a framework for our approach to artificial general intelligence and what their approach, their framework, as they've described, is, is oriented really towards the practical perspective on the evolution of the developments side and practical benchmarking of how we make those stages of progression towards that. Whereas Max Tegmark thinks about it in this broader philosophical and futuristic perspective on the overall evolution of intelligence. 
So he classifies life and, and, and intelligent life, particularly in three different phases. And that's where life 3.0 comes from. So life 1.0 is biological life. Think worms and cells and so on that, um, that evolved its hardware. It, it has no control over its hardware. And its software also was evolved through natural selection. And software would be sort of the nervous system and, and you know, how it thinks and so on, ultimately. Uh, you know, not the worms. They're not thinking, but they have a nervous system. Um, and then Life 2.0 is where we're living right now. And that's a cultural influence on life that allows through education and through the fact that humans are the only ones that have advanced their intelligence in life to this stage where humans actually pursue pedagogy. <clears throat> we teach our offspring and we learn ourselves and we change our software through that learning process. And so in effect, what he's saying is that we can't change our hardware yet but we, which is our body, right? We can't change our hardware. We can add technology on the outside, but we can redesign our software. We can change our minds. So that's life 2.0. Then life 3.0 is a technological kind of life that can design both its hardware and its software. And that's what advanced AI is going to allow us to do. Um, so, this concept of 3.0 is relevant to artificial general intelligence. And, and in this book, and it has eight chapters, I think, uh, and, and we could recite those, but in this book, he lays out uh, uh, in chapter five, uh, the story of the Omega team, which describes artificial general intelligence being released into artificial superintelligence. The distinction between those two, I think, is generally understood. Artificial general intelligence is, okay, a, a, a technological intelligence that can perform at about the level of a human. So it has reasoning capabilities, it's self-directed, it can do things. Uh, and a superintelligence, ASI, is one that can recursively redesign itself, both its hardware and its software, so that it advances in this iterative fashion at the speed of technology that is far faster than the speed of evolution. All right, so big ideas. And, and I shared this on an earlier show, this story of the Omega team, but I'll just give you an idea of, of this uh, progression, this rapid progression once artificial superintelligence is achieved. So the, the story that he puts in this chapter five is about the Omega team. It illustrates the idea of an intelligence explosion once an AI system reaches the capability to design and improve itself. So this AI that the, the Omega team develops is called Prometheus, and it advances from subhuman capability to superhuman capability within the first day of its release by recursively optimizing its own architecture in multiple generations. So here's the story quickly. Uh, on the first day, at 9 a.m., Prometheus version 1.0 is launched. It was slightly worse than the human programmers at AI development, and it was being asked to focus on its own development at this point. So within the first hour, Prometheus delivered version 2.0 of itself, which was slightly better than version 1.0, but still subhuman. But just four hours later at 2 p.m., version 5.0 was released, and it had, uh, it, it had blown past the team's performance benchmarks. It, it could no longer even be evaluated by the human team that was overseeing it, and it was accelerating. And by nightfall, Prometheus version 10.0 was deploying, and the recursive process was continuing, and they were ready to deploy Prometheus in the pursuit of certain objectives that they had, including making money to support the overall objectives of the Omega team. Now, I want to jump ahead to say that control of such a, you know, an explosion was very important in this story. And the story progresses 
and I encourage you to read it. But the story progresses. It's not a dystopian story. It shows how AI, with the correct controls, was able to create a very beneficial environment in this context of life 3.0 for the humans who are uh, you know, on the planet at the same time as this super intelligence. Um, and and uh, so let me just uh, wrap up by saying uh, one of the ways that they controlled that is they really kind of put an airlock around Prometheus and it could only reach out into the real world with supervision from humans. So they, they didn't give it unfettered access to the world. And, and that prevented this, the dystopian scenario from emerging. And I want to just share with you a little bit about Max Tegmark's approach to the questions about the dangers of the release of superintelligence. Uh, and, and in 2014, he founded a, an organization called the Future of Life Institute. And you can find that at futureoflife.org. And I want to just read to you about the principles behind uh, their approach to that. This is now the, um, you know, Max Tegmark founded Future of Life Institute, uh, their approach to concerns about and regulation of artificial intelligence. They also look at nuclear weapons and, uh, you know, bioweapons and so on. But here, I'll just read quickly and then I'll, and then I'll uh, leave it to our discussion. But our AI is racing forward. Companies are increasingly creating general purpose AI systems that perform many tasks. LLMs compose poetry, create dinner recipes, and write computer code. Some of these models already pose major risks, such as erosion of democratic processes, rampant bias and misinformation, and an arms race in autonomous weapons. But there is potentially worse to come. AI systems will only get more capable. Corporations are actively pursuing artificial general intelligence, which can perform as well or better than humans at a wide range of tasks. This will bring unprecedented benefits. But on the flip side, more than half of AI experts believe there is a chance that this technology could cause our extinction. This belief has nothing to do with evil robots or sentient machines. It is that AI can enable those seeking to do harm by easily executing complex processing tasks without conscience. And uh, so militaries could lose control of high-performing systems designed to do harm with devastating impact. An advanced AI system tasked with maximizing company profits could employ drastic, unpredictable methods. Even an AI program to do something altruistic could pursue a destructive method to achieve that goal. We currently have no good way of knowing how AI systems will act when released because no one, not even their creators, understand how they work. Boom. Mic drop. Uh, that was awesome, Andy, as I fully expected it to be. Um, one of the things you brought up, and I just wanted to bring up, you didn't mention this part of the book, at least from what I read, and again, this is my chat GPT and perplexity summary of the book. So perhaps it's wrong, but my understanding is in the book, this Omega team, when they deploy the super intelligence, they do it to actually gain immense wealth so that they can then take that wealth and apply it to whether it be sciences, human needs, whether whatever that might be. But I think it brings up the larger question. It sounds like Max is also talking about that in the future of life, which is who who is in control and is that necessarily a great thing whether that's a corporation whether that's a country you know is it in the best interest if let's say a, a, a the government the united states government ends up having they're the omega team in in so many words right and they have a airlock around a prometheus like in the next several years let's say is is that good for all that you know the united states might stand for and say for democracy and helping is it is it detrimental if you, who gets to this? I guess what I'm getting is who gets to decide who's on the team? Cause it, I guess in the book there, they bring about the the brightest and they have a small team and they do the right things, I guess, in the book. Like you said, it's not a dystopian story, but in real life, it seems to me that it's a race towards getting that airlock 
around uh, Prometheus and it's not going to lead to more people wanting to share openly. It's going to lead to what I think we're seeing a little bit, even with open AI and others, which is more of a closed off walled garden where they're saying, well, we don't, we no longer want to share what we're finding because it's at such a level that it could be dangerous in our view if somebody else was to get it. And now there's no, there's no sharing across the, you know, across the water or whatever the case is. So I don't know if you wanted to touch on that or anybody else did, but that was something I brought up in my, I saw in the notes that I thought was interesting in the book that that's how they chose to solve problems was basically gain wealth, use wealth to then go fix bigger problems. Yeah. So I'll just make a quick comment about that. That That's just one chapter in the book is the story. Okay. Of the and which is that, and and a, a large part of it that is really profoundly interesting is his deep dive into the logic of how autonomous weapon systems evolve in in practice in the hands of you know uh, bad actors against good actors if you can characterize it that way and that how, how inherently difficult to impossible it is to control that and what the uh, what the downstream effects of that are. So it's not only about one central AGI, it's about many super AGIs out there, many of them in the hands of people who have nefarious objectives. Right, right. And one of the things that I think, one of the things that like jumped out at me as I was prepping for the show um, is a phrase that we see a lot that we want to make sure that AI, AGI, ASI is in alignment with human values, but we're not in alignment with human values, right? That's not an agreed upon thing across humanity, which just calls into question for me, like, yay, let's do that. But, uh, let, you know, are we going to have a conversation about what we think human values are? And, and depending on how it's phrased, right, it's, it starts to say, oh, well, that's not the way I phrase the human value. That must be biased. So now I'm, I mean, it just like, it is a can of worms. And at the same time, yes, we want it in alignment with human values as opposed to not being alignment with human values, right? I mean, if the if it's door one or two, we definitely want door one. But uh, I I think there's not agreement about what what's behind door one. Yeah, for the, for the good of, for the good of everyone is a relative term who for the who's who's getting to decide for the good of everyone you know and we see that in micro environments obviously all we have to do is look back through history and all the atrocities and things where you know it's the spanish inquisition and 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 what the catholic church was involved in through the years and stuff like that just to see what for the good of humanity looks like misguided but at the time perhaps looks like this is the best for everybody. That's in history. Now what happens when you put a Prometheus in their hands? And what does that mean for the 7 billion humans who are currently living on the US and continuing to grow in population? So it's it's interesting. I mean, it's a really, really, like you said, Andy, I think you kind of said it. It's a thought-provoking story. And I guess that's the point, right? It's the, it's the it, it was to generate conversations like this. And, and hopefully thousands or millions of these micro conversations of people talking about this openly and saying, hey, this is a complex problem. This cannot be solved easily. Um, but the best thing we can do is talk about it. The worst thing we can do is go silent because um, that, that won't get us anywhere. That won't that won't get any hands reaching across any aisles, political or otherwise. I'm just using that as an analogy. And um, Andy, people, Andy made this point when he was when he was giving the intro. But again, this was written in 2017. So he wasn't, I mean, it was published in 2017. So it was written whenever it was written, slightly before 2017. But also, um, like, he he's clearly in many rooms of watching when it's happening. But it, the conversations were not happening then. Hey, it's probably two years, maybe three years, maybe five at the outside. And we're at this threshold. That was not a predicted, um, like a, as much of an agreed upon prediction as it seems to be now. And uh, and I wonder how this phrasing or uh, the way that the book is laid out, I wonder what would be changed if it were going to happen today, if it were going to be written today. Yeah, with the knowledge of of the 
world's reaction to like 3.5 and from November 2022 on, so to speak, uh, would be interesting because it's not as if GPT three or two or one never existed. Of course they did. They existed because it didn't just it just didn't happen in November 2022. These things have all been happening. Machine learning has been happening for decades, but it was just this tipping point at which it captured the world's attention and they went from like zero to whatever it was jimmy like what one million one million um five days one million five days five days one million users i was like subscribers what's the word i'm looking for yeah one million users in five days and if you look back at, at facebook and other benchmarks earlier than that it just it wiped the floor with them hey before we get deeper into this conversation i want to remind everybody that if you are enjoying this conversation and you maybe it's your first time to the show maybe you're a long time listener like a lot of our folks in the comments who we greatly appreciate they show up daily and they add to the conversation we we really appreciate that you can head over to the daily show.com that's a good landing page because what it'll do is number one it'll tell you how to see past shows obviously you can find them on youtube you can find them on uh, linkedin you can find them on spotify and other places but the daily i show is really sort of our one-stop shop also what you could do there is if you like these kind of conversations if you like the types of things that we're talking about and you're like hey i would i would actually take a little bit more of this or maybe a different angle that's why we started our newsletter and so we put that out once a week on uh sundays we are about episode or um it would be edition number seven i think this week um so we're just getting into it seven yeah <laughs> beth says yes seven um and so you can go sign up for that it's obviously absolutely free we're only sending out that newsletter nothing else is going out with it and then also, you know, if you are not in today's particular show, but if you are working with your, your company or you own a company, you just work there and you're trying to figure out how to navigate, you know, AI for your business, then I would encourage you to reach out to us, go to that website, reach out to us. As you can see on our screen here from all our little subtitles, we all have different disciplines um, that we come from. I, I focus in sales. Obviously, everybody else has different disciplines in AI. And what we ultimately try to do is bring all of our collective experience um, from our team to help and work with other people's teams, whatever that might be. So um, go check that out. Want to make sure everybody knows about that. And Bill, please like and subscribe if you're enjoying this. Um, we're here five days a week. And yeah, uh, August 7th when it will be actually our one year anniversary of the show. So it's coming up soon. I um, want to make sure everybody knows that Carl is also here as well. He joined a little bit a while ago, but Andy was giving such an amazing uh, intro there that we we didn't want to break that. But welcome, Carl. And I, I just ask you, have you read did you happen to read this book? Did you know about it? I was saying I didn't know about this before Andy brought it up or anything like that. And what's been your, you know, your perspective about it before kind of getting into today's show, like yeah, leading well, up to the show? I, you know, I honestly, I, I haven't read it or did I perplexity, um, like summarize it. So I just uh, pretty much just listening to Andy, um, give his world famous descriptions of it. So, um, I think the, the, the interesting point here is that if we go back to the, oh, right. Um, I had, I was trying to find where I saw this number, but it only said that 7.7, .7, there are only 7.7 .7 million chat GPT plus users around the world. And then it broke down other subscriptions just for open AI. So if you think about that, that's not very many people that actually, you know, you, I would say people who pay for it probably use it regularly. Just you just can't use it on a on that basis on like with the with the limits. So I would say though to get the actual build up to to what Max was talking about, we need more and more people to actually use the tool or use the tools. And if you go back to the router study, which what was it like 54% new chat GBT, and then everybody else was like in the single digits or very low double digits, like 11, 12%. So uh, that number to me was big because then it's like, okay, well, it's really, really, really early. And to get to that tipping point, you need way more users than that actual you like even enterprise users, I would say, kind of fall in that bucket because the enterprises are trying to tell their people to use it. They're using it kind of in very siloed ways. And if you look at the enterprise um, uh, revenue, it wasn't it wasn't in the billions. It was like overall, it's a billion, three point four billion. But 
enterprise revenue was still pretty small. So you've got to think there is big, 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 big groups, swaths of people that still haven't used it on a regular, using AI on a regular basis. So I think that's, that's something important to, to, to keep in mind too, as we move, as we think about this and what Max was talking about. I'm sorry, as regards what Max is talking about, um, the vast unwashed population who do not understand how AI works or what its capabilities are will only be confronted by AI's outputs in the context of the things that Max is afraid of, which is, okay, in the hands of people who are you know, trying to influence the political environment, it's misinformation on a grand scale. They don't know that that's actually happening. You know how there's bot farms in Russia that are you know, pretending to be humans. Well, they don't need to have a, a big building filled with you know, people sitting at terminals anymore if they have super AGI to do that on a massive scale globally in, and in order to influence opinions and basically shift people's attitudes away from focus on the the sort of the terroristic aspects of what um, of what Russia's doing to Ukraine and instead blame it all on NATO for even pretending that it was okay to bring in Ukraine into a defensive alliance. You know that you know all of that can shift global attitudes on a scale unprecedented. Right. And it's one of the reasons that when you hear us talk about those things, we're more often talking about China rather than Russia, because China's game in this context is much more elevated than we understand Russia's to be, right? In terms of uh, their ability to do something like this. They're really where I believe human people like there's not human people, but let's just go with it. There were human people in bot farms <laughs> in Russia. <laughs> um, well, no, but uh, you, you, you've seen, you've seen. Okay, we've all seen the 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 mobile farms, right? So it's not the bot farms aren't going to be. It's going to be the exact same thing where you have like walls upon walls of mobile devices. Right. And the whole job of that is to, you know, whatever comments, clicks, whatever you need to get the engagement level, you have that, you can essentially buy that and rent that. So yeah, for, for it to have bot farms and so on, it's yeah, I, but it's hard though, cause you have to, this is where the education component comes in, where when you talk about the unwashed masses, you, you can't literally, you cannot believe anything you see or hear on, on social, like you can't. You have to like triple check that. You can't just run with it, right? Because like the there's so many things that came out. Like a, a new story would come out, and then five different takes, twenty different takes would come out of it, and then the takes is it? It isn't a take. Some people say it's true, but you just don't know, right? You just, you you like when you have to double, triple, quadruple check that um, until it actually you know it's like oh okay that's actually legit. But by that time, a lot of people have already bought into it. So it's kind of the the dangerous point. And with AI, you can do it so so quickly. Too. Right. Also, just want a quick po- uh, push back that uh, m- the unwashed masses are likely uh, clearer about manipulation than the washed mas- masses. I can't even talk. But uh, you can you can be part of what we're talking about as the unwashed mass, even if you wash several times a day. Because it's not about washing. You know, I just had a, a recent, um, you know, uh, what what was it, two days ago. Uh, like I said, I'm overseas. And so at some point in the morning, I on social media, I caught the story of the assassination attempt on former President Trump in the United States. And, you know, Carl, to your point, I guess, like the first thing I did was go somewhere else to validate that what I saw was in fact true. Because the first because the first place I saw it was on social media and in this, this charge climate, you know, political climate that we have in the United States right now, it's reasonable to assume that something like that could be fake. There was nothing about the video that would make me think somebody couldn't with, with the right tools and the right, you know, the right desire, um, to fake something like that, which is, 
you know, I, I don't know, both sad and whatever, but like, that's the world we live in. And, you know, that the first thing I wanted to do was say, wait, hold on. Where is that? Well, let me see that. And so I'm constantly saying this to my daughter as well, which is like, she'll say, oh, it's a, you know, she'll joke and say it's like a new trend on TikTok. And I'll be like, don't believe everything you see on TikTok. You know, I want to make sure my daughters are growing up in a, in a world where she has a whole different level of criteria that she has to live with in her life that I didn't have to live with at 13. You know, there might've been a doctored photo or something like that. And, you know, whatever the case is, um, but nothing like what she is being, um, shown daily and, and and it would be silly to think oh i'll i'll put a bubble around her and i'll protect her i can't i can't protect her all i can keep telling her is just remember what you see might be fake it could be fake as real as it looks it might be fake and she gives me a lot of that yeah 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 dad i know you think everything is fake i said no 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 these are the conversations that i think parents are having all over the world is that you have to be really, really careful. And it does kind of, I think it, to circle back to the book, obviously, I think it does go in line with what Max uh, seemed to be saying was there's a, there's a lot to, to take in. Mm -hmm. And it seems like he does a really good job of talking about the whole and not just talking about a particular piece, which I think is really, really cool. And I think Andy, you, you sort of laid that out for us. It, I think it really is indicative of his background and his economics background and his MIT background and, you know, all the things that he was able to do or has been able to do in his life um, gives him this sort of worldview. We were sort of talking about that yesterday in the show with this idea of generalist versus specialist. And it, it seems to me that he has enough worldly knowledge to be a, you know, um, welcome the voice when it comes to the future of AI, you know, and we need more people like him, maybe not necessarily at his education level, but people who are the bricklayers, are the people who aren't necessarily being touched by AI today to be part of this conversation. Because the last thing we want to do is exclude them by saying, well, it doesn't touch you today. Yes, it's like you're a bricklayer. Don't worry. You've got probably a good 5, 10, 15 years before the robots can do your job better than you and can put up a building. And they go, I'm good. I don't really need to know about the AI stuff. It doesn't affect me at all in my life, really. Like, how do we get more of those people into the conversation and get them to care, which is tough because, you know, we all individually kind of care about our own lives and how it affects us personally. So how do you get them to care about the larger thing? I think Andy in the book, doesn't he talk about the next 10,000 years, the next billion years and how we need to have a long-term view that perhaps sometimes sacrifices a little bit of the short-term goal. We need to be thinking way, way down the road to figure out how something like a Prometheus is going to affect humanity, interworldly humanity for, for eons, you know? Yeah. And you know, humans are you know notoriously bad at long-term thinking. So right. yeah, he, yeah it's, so it's, it's easy to say that it's really difficult to put into practice. Before we close out, I just want to mention some other aspects of the book, which are really kind of intellectually interesting. So chapter six is on the, the future of life, and then he discusses economic inequality, job displacement, and so on, and has actual practical advice to parents all the way back in 2017 about what the criteria are for the kinds of things that you ought to have your children thinking about in terms of the, the you know, decisions that you make about what you're going to do with your life uh, in the context of what's going to happen with the advent of AGI. Uh, chapter seven, fascinating, is about consciousness. And he makes a very cogent argument about consciousness being substrate independent, meaning it, it, consciousness exists in our substrate, which is neurons in our brain. But that's not what's necessary. And he, and he kind of walks through, I think, a logical proof of why consciousness is not dependent on what substrate you're applying the intelligence on, meaning it can arise, consciousness can arise in non-biological entities. So that's his life 3.0. It's a technological intelligence that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to include humans, right? But that hey, intelligence can proceed. Go ahead, Beth. I know you're wrapping up, but I want to ask, what's the difference between consciousness and sentience? Are they synonyms? Well, no, 
um, sentience, it, it means that you can sense something. And I think it's arguable that, you know, sensors know. connected to that, you know, and, and consciousness is the, is the awareness of the sensory inputs, right? So they're, they're related, but not synonymous. Thank you. Um, I do want to bring in a comment from earlier. Let me scroll back and pull it in. And Justin had said, we didn't know it at the time, but 2017 was revolutionary for AI with the introduction of Transformers and Max Tegmark's AGI Insights. Yeah, it's it's interesting, uh, Justin. I, I always think to, I was working in business intelligence in 2017, sort of transferring back out of entrepreneurship at the time and just starting to get into that data analytics and machine learning, like every every company we talked to was like, we want machine learning. In the same way, people would say we're building AI today. In 2017, it was it was ML, 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 ML. Everybody wanted it. They didn't know what it meant. They just know they needed it for their business to get ahead. And so we dealt with that a lot, obviously. So it's really interesting to think back to 2017 and to, and to sort of watch this AI evolution slowly roll out, just in my perception. But then to your point, to know that like what will probably be earmarked as extremely important years, the invention of the transformer and how that basically was the birth of a lot of the AI that we know today and what they're capable of from the general intelligence. So just wanted to highlight that comment. Um, really appreciate it. We appreciate everybody, Jen and Justin and Cisco and, and everybody else that's in our comment section. You guys are the best. Um, somebody was just saying um, they'll have to go back uh, to the beginning, uh, cause I missed the beginning of the show. Yeah, absolutely. We were talking about that earlier. Um, definitely go back in and check this one out. And we talked about a lot of these topics on other shows as well. Um, coming up tomorrow, we have the news. So every Wednesday we talk about the news. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the news right now. We talked a little bit about, um, strawberry. We mentioned it as well as, um, the five levels of AGI that I talked about. Um, so those will come up, I'm sure tomorrow, as well as perhaps in individual shows, because I think they probably take, they need that attention at this point. Um, and then, uh, Thursday, we're going to be talking about power, 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 more power because AI and what any of this that we're talking about right now for any of this to actually exist in the future, um, is going to take immense amounts of power. What does that really mean? Where is that going to come from? You know, I was saying yesterday quickly, we are looking at power consumption on orders of not cities, but countries. So where does that come from? It's, you know, who's going to do it? How, what types of power? We're going to talk all about, about that, all about that tomorrow. And then finally on Friday, that's our two week recap show. So every two weeks on Friday, we stop. We don't have a new topic. We actually look back two weeks, talk about all these types of topics, new discussions that have come up, news that has come up around these topics and just have a general open conversation. So go check out, uh, go come back all week and then definitely go check out the daily Um, like and subscribe if you don't want to miss these shows. Like I said, we do this five days a week um, and we haven't missed a Monday through Friday yet. We have gone through, somebody has been here every single holiday, every single day. And uh, I don't know, I feel like we want to keep that that streak going. So keep on coming back and hanging out with us, guys. Um, thank you, Andy, for such an amazing intro and for bringing this book to our, our attention and now bringing it out to the masses so everybody else can learn about it too. So hopefully everybody will go check out the book and go uh, go read it. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we will see you guys uh, tomorrow for the news. Until then, have a great day. Aloha. Aloha.